from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. Some breaking news today from the Alabama Supreme Court. The High Court ruled in favor of the Alabama Department of Transportation in a lawsuit that sought to block the state from building a new bridge over the intercoastal waterway to Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. In the unanimous decision, the justices overturned a lower court's injunction that had halted construction on the project on claims from a local toll bridge company that ALDOT was acting in bad faith. The ruling will now allow that project to continue. Tony Harris, chief spokesman for ALDOT, said the need for a new free bridge to Alabama's beaches is obvious and called the ruling a victory for coastal residents and millions of visitors to our state. Well, at this point, almost all of Alabama's students have returned to the classroom, and Governor Kay Ivey this week has been making visits to primary and elementary schools with a special focus on turnaround schools. Those are the schools with a history of low performance that have been specifically selected for intensive attention and rapid improvement. Ivy visited J.E. Hobbs Elementary and ABC Elementary in Wilcox County, Jerry Lee Fain Elementary in Dothan, and Dozier Elementary in Montgomery. She also visited Prattville Elementary in Autauga County to recognize its students for their leading participation in her Summer Reading Challenge. Ivy, along with State Superintendent Eric Mackey and local education officials, welcomed students back and encouraged them to keep reading. Prattville Elementary, I'd like to congratulate you all for participating in my Summer Reading Challenge. You all read the most books and sent me the most letters this summer. And for that, y'all deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Promise me that you'll keep reading. Talk to your friends about the books you read. Share your favorite stories. And let your excitement for reading continue to grow. I'll let you in on a secret. The more you read, the better you'll get. Just like practicing a sport or playing an instrument, reading gets easier and more exciting as you go. The focus on elementary schools is no accident. Those are home to third graders. And this school year will be the first that the accountability provision of the Alabama Literacy Act goes into effect. That law says third grade students must read proficiently or they will not be promoted to the fourth grade. This provision had been extended two years by the legislature on the basis of COVID setbacks. But in an op-ed this week, Ivy said no more delays would be acceptable because it's not fair to students to pass them along without proper reading skills. Well, they hadn't been getting up to reading level, so we've got to start somewhere. And the Literacy Act says you've got to read by proficiently by the third grade or be held back. I think it's a, a good tool to have in place because students need to learn to read. But I think it's purposeful uh, in order for students to read the level of proficiency. We've reported extensively on the $2.1 billion in federal funds the state received and doled out from the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. This week, state lawmakers met again here in the State House to keep tabs on how those dollars are being allocated by agencies. The spending deadlines that once seemed far away are drawing closer. Capitol Journal's Karen Goldsmith reports. The American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA funds, can be used for a number of state functions. There's also a list of what the revenue cannot be used for. can't use it to reduce uh, offset or reduction in tax revenue. You can't make a deposit into a pension fund to shore up an unfunded liability. Uh, you can't use it to match federal funds. Uh, and you can't deposit the ARPA funds into a rainy day account. So the point is, uh, Congress wanted states to spend these monies, not tuck them away. In his presentation, State Finance Director Bill Poole shared that the ARPA funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024 and spent by December 31st, 2026. But those termination dates are going to become more and more critical as we move through this process. So I would encourage the committee through its work to stay very focused on that 
uh, the Department of Finance will be. Those deadlines raise the eyebrows of State Senators Chris Elliott and Greg Albritton. And actually getting that money out through the process and then mm -hmm. obligated and then expended concerns me. My question from a 10,000 foot view for you is, when does the Department of Finance start saying, we've got to have a deadline, an internal deadline that is prior to December of 2026? You know, our first challenge is the obligated by December 1, 2024. I'm gonna look back to make sure I say this right, but I believe in our MOUs, we require a reporting for anything unobligated by the summer of 2024 so that we have June of 2024. So we've got about a six months uh, deadline on the obligated funds. Now moving to the expended because that's where then the rubber's really gonna hit the road because that's when you're looking at deadlines and the potential of clawback. Uh, there's a lot of effort all across the states right now talking to Treasury and others to define how, what does expended mean? What doesn't it mean? There's some ambiguity on those. The legislature is going to have to revisit and figure out if we can't use the funds for this, if we have to, if the reallocation has to occur, not only how does that go there, but the next question is, do we leave that project left uh, half done? Do we leave a water tower sitting there empty? How do we deal with that? Uh, that's the last place we want to go, but I, I suggest that those are going to be challenges that we're going to have to deal with in the future. So uh, uh, this gets more difficult as we go. It doesn't get any easier. For Capital Journal, I'm Karen Goldsmith. We should note that the state has been compliant with all federal requirements regarding the use of these funds. But with project delays brought on by supply chain issues and competition for building materials, Senator Chris Elliott asked how the state could pivot if those spending deadlines aren't met. Here we are at December 24, and we hadn't started, and our, we're getting, well, this is squirrely. We're not sure you're going to be able to complete it. To Senator Albritton's point, what if we have half a project done? I would hazard a guess the feds don't want to pay for a ditch with nothing in it. What, what point do we say? This isn't realistic, and it's time, it's time to reallocate these funds, not just because we don't think you're going to complete it in time, but because we have to reallocate it to a project that can be, uh, uh, that stands a chance of actually completing it. In June of 24, and this uh, is consistent with uh, the Finance Department, uh, Director Poole's comment earlier, that there's a checkpoint at June of 24, and again at June of 26, we have milestones in these contractual agreements that we enter into with each of these pro projects. They have an obligation to have uh, these funds uh, committed and expanded within the statutory limits. Now, if a project is underway but cannot meet the statutory limit, the funds that have not, that cannot be expended within the statutory requirement will be withdrawn and applied to a different project. Now, we don't want to leave projects half completed or whatever percent complete. Our backup position on that is we will make available to them state revolving fund loans in the future years as, as needed to finish their projects or they will have to come up with funding of some sort. Chief Budget Officer Kirk Fulford offered a complete breakdown to lawmakers about how those funds had been appropriated. In the state fiscal recovery monies, $2.12 billion, although not your purpose, I did want to highlight the fact that your counties got $952 million that went straight to your counties. Metropolitan cities got $430 million that went straight to those big cities. Those are the ones above 50,000 generally. Uh, Non-entitlement cities, 350, those are your smaller uh, cities, $356 million. Fulford also broke down the difference between what funds had been allocated by agency versus what had been spent, an important difference given the deadlines. Water and sewer and broadband projects as, as these things hit, uh, you, you know, as soon as you can get something moving, it starts moving and money flowing. But there's a paperwork process, there's, a, there's 
uh, things that have to be bought and you have to get the stuff in the ground. So there is going to be a delay there. Nothing's been spent so far that you can see in terms of administrative costs of the agencies. The hospital and nursing home money is already out. Um, but there's where everything stands. And again, to uh, Chairman Albright's point, to Senator Elliott's point, there's a lot of stuff that has to actually be expended between now and 2026. Whether some of this stuff and some of the smaller entities, once it gets out there, can be facilitated in a timely manner. And that's something that this committee is certainly going to have to keep an eye on because you have to leave yourself enough time to be able to reallocate money as necessary. The legislature appropriated $330 million of ARPA money toward broadband internet expansion in rural areas. Given the time constraints, Senator Bobby Singleton asked if wireless connections built off those broadband connections could be utilized to help rural areas connect to the Internet. Because all of our money is being focused on in-ground fiber. And I know we need to bring fiber off of a tower to be able to do it. But to get to some of these rural, rural areas, we're not going to get there strictly by fiber. Are we considering as a as 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 a product to use wireless connectivity? Because it's getting better and better every day. The, the strength is, is getting out there much further instead of less contact points. Are we are we considering that as a part of the solution versus just all wire? Because we use a lot of money in the ground just using fiber. But I think that we can come off of that and build off of that fiber and do some wireless connectivity and get to more of those rural communities. Absolutely, absolutely. We are, we are considering all technology that can provide the speeds um, that, that are required. So that's, um, we're gonna need all of the partners to get to all of the addresses. Okay, thank you. Speaking of rural Alabama, the state is always looking for ways to bring economic development to the Black Belt. There's a new effort to do just that and it's using resources that go back millions of years. Yes, millions. Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports. You're looking at what could be the largest classroom in Alabama, also a pretty big state attraction. This is Bragg's, Alabama, and we're looking for some historical artifacts. That's Jack ahead of our ATV. Dimp Bell is driving, and paleontologist Jeff McCraw sits next to Bell. We're heading toward a creek bed on the Cornwallis homestead. I first thought when I came that there wouldn't be much to, to see or do. But Bell insisted McCraw take another look. Each time I come, I see new, new treasures, new finds that we're making. And uh, so there's a lot of potential here to uh, have certain places for kids and even adults to, to come and learn about uh, paleontology, to come and learn about the fossils that were alive during the time of the dinosaurs. Bell and his family own this property. The grandfather says he was inspired to do something with it after spending time with his children, finding fossils of animals such as crabs and plants up to 60 million years old. After I retired for the second time, which was the first of the year, uh, I was in a meeting and someone at the end of the meeting says, hey Demp, would you be interested in letting schools come and do field trips? Did you know over 50 million years ago in this part of Alabama in Lowndes County, dinosaurs actually roamed this land? That's a true statement, and there's some people here who want folks to come to this area to see for themselves and find out some other interesting discoveries. Bell says he wants to help renew interest in nature. We're outside. We're in the woods. We're on the, one of the lakes, either fishing or building something or learning about nature, forest, uh, the, anything that can teach them hands-on. Uh, and I thought, yeah, that'd be great for children. He says the idea is to use this area as a classroom and an attraction, bringing people here to see and study history with nature. A list probably almost a page long from uh, professors. I got four coming two weeks from now, from, two, from the Mississippi and from Alabama. I've had uh, the, everything from the Audubon to uh, other organizations birding here on birds, uh, from everything from wildlife uh, to the fisheries. So we're hoping to turn it into the first of the year, uh, a place where schools will be able to come and do tours uh, uh, as far as uh, educational hands-on. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. With one week to go until college football season, things were getting spirited 
at the Capitol this week, mascots and student leaders from all the state's public universities gathered with Governor Ivey to promote College Colors Day, which is September 1st. Gordon Stone of the Higher Education Partnership noted that universities make a $20 billion impact on the state. And there you see Albie with his buddy Kay Ivey, students from the University of South Alabama with T-Roy in the background there. Of course, Big Al uh, being silly. Uh, University of Montevallo mascot and AUM's mascot. Pretty sure everybody made it. You got Athens State there. Um, so remember to wear your college colors next week. Um, we will do the same here at Capital Journal. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Joining me next is Congressman Jerry Carl, representing Alabama's 1st District. Congressman, thanks for coming on the show. Great to be with you, Todd. Well, it is August recess when Congress, members of Congress get to spend extended time uh, back home visiting with constituents, going, you know, visiting throughout the district. I'm curious how you spent your August and where all you've been um, these last few weeks. Uh, we've been to a couple of groundbreakings. We've been to several tours, uh, some plant tours. Uh, we've met with uh, about four different hospitals trying to figure out the needs uh, in the future for the hospitals, obviously, which is, is uh, very important. And we met with a lot of constituents uh, in a lot of different ways. So every day has been packed. Every day has been busy. Uh, that's the way I like it. Uh, we even reached over into uh, Covington County a little bit. That's going to be our uh, definitely it's going to be in our new district. Um, uh, so I, we've reached over there a little bit, went over and introduced ourselves to some of the folks over there and kind of getting a feel for, you know, what, what we need to do there. And, uh, it, it's been, it's been quite, quite busy. I heard, I heard it referred to as August vacation one time and I start laughing. I'm wondering when the vacation part starts. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, recess maybe is the wrong way to put it. That's more of a technical term, right? Um, kind of a, but it's it's certainly a, a work time, or, or at least the the smart members of Congress use it as a work time because that's when oh, sure. you get to. And so I'm curious. You, you talk about visiting with constituents. What what feedback you've heard? Because that's really important. It's not just you, members of Congress, talking to them. It's them talking to you. It's a really important time for feedback. So I'm wondering what feedback you've gotten, maybe what has stood out, maybe something you didn't expect? Well, I don't know that I've heard anything that I didn't expect. Uh, we've met with the fishing community. That was a big meeting yesterday. We, we brought in the sports fishermen. We brought in the scientists. We had a, had a real good two-hour roundtable session uh, looking at the rice whale issue in the Gulf. We're looking at the snapper issue, amberjack issue. Uh, how it affects the sporting and the recreational industry. Uh, I learned a lot about rice whales yesterday, and, and, and uh, so I'm. That probably was the most surprising thing. But you know, working with the hospitals, I'm a little worried uh, about some of the reimbursement issues in the rural hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually with the urban hospitals today. Um, it's a little different situation there. But meeting with constituents themselves, uh, you know, the biggest issue has been. The border issue, obviously, it's been the Biden issue, uh, whether it's Joe Biden or Hunter Biden. And that's the number one question we get. You know, what are you going to do to fix that? Uh, and I remind them we write laws. I remind them that we've got, you know, we've got Jordan, uh, Jim Jordan. We, we've got folks up there that are working to uncover the information that we've seen so far. If, if the House hadn't uh, been uncovering this, it would never even be talked about. So. Uh, I try to point out the process or, or the process we hope 
by, you know, shining some light on what we're finding out. And hopefully the, the media will pick up on it and start running with it. Uh, folks are worried about, you know, our farm community, you know, talking about our, our farm issues. We have farm bill coming up. Now, what's in the farm bill? How the farm bill is going to play out? Do we think we have enough votes on the floor? You know, the, the typical questions that obviously your farm community would want answered. So I'm doing the best I can do on, on that issue. We, we haven't been exposed to the entire bill yet. Uh, we, we've got the, the rough outlines of it, and I was able to talk about that. Well, soon you will return to Washington. And once you get back there, there's a pretty tall task of funding the government, right? We're coming up on this fiscal deadline of the end of September. It happens every year. Um, and once again, we're coming up on it again. Um, you are on the Appropriations Committee, so you're a, a part of this process. Is there any hope for a deal, a spending deal to be made between the two sides, the House and the Senate, and, and obviously the White House? Or are we, are we looking maybe at a government shutdown? Well, it, it, there's always hope. Uh, you know, we, we might do a CR, you know, continuous resolution. Uh, that that's not playing out very well with with some of our Republican friends. They, you know, they I, I truly think that they want to shut down in, in some instances. But, you know, I'm, I'm holding out and trying to be positive about it. We've got 10 of the 12 appropriation packages put together. We've got two more that we'll work on when we get back. Uh, we'll we'll get those processed and we'll start voting on them one one at a time on the floor. As you well know, the Senate is is a crapshoot. Uh, you know, last year we kept getting CRs from them and we went right up to Christmas Eve and I got real close to spending Christmas Eve in the air, uh, Atlanta airport. Uh, and and I you know I, they call it DC. Everybody thinks that means the District of Columbia, but in reality, I think it stands for Drama Central. Um, these politicians love the drama, waiting to the last minute and trying to get something pushed through. But I'm positive in, in that uh, I hope this is uh, us being off. It's given us a little bit of time to hear from our constituents. Nobody wants to shut down. We don't need the government shut down. We, we don't need simple things uh, in, in our lives uh, that are very complicated things in other people's lives, you know, to be shut down. And, uh, you know, you look at payrolls, you look at disruptions in people's lives that that's not fair mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're all grown adults on that floor you think we could get together and, and come up with with a solution but we'll see we're we're, we're ready for it well yeah because you, you kind of alluded to it there's starting to be all these demands about you know what needs to be included in a cr in a continuing resolution for, for folks to support it the freedom caucus had theirs the other day and i'm curious do you is this more i mean every member is different Right. But is a lot of this and you're going to see the same from the left. Absolutely. Is a lot of this more political or ideological? And by that, I mean, you know, we used to call it the, the vote no, hope yes caucus. Right. Like we're like, vote, we're going to vote no and make a big stink about it and hopefully get our cable news hit. But we actually really want it to pass because we don't truly want the government shut down. So I'm, I'm wondering. If, if that's an element at play here or if there's there is a chaos element. Well, the Freedom Caucus understands they control a handful of votes and we need that handful of votes. We only have about a four vote margin of Republicans versus Democrats. So they understand they hold that margin uh, and and they have they've come up with some good stuff. I'll be fair. I'll be fair with them that everything that that they've asked to be done, I don't disagree with at all. Uh, we're at a point now, though, I think we truly need to work behind closed doors and get things worked out and not get on the floor and argue about mm -hmm. it. That, that, that's where, where I'll start differing. Uh, I, you know, I disagree with, with my staff, but once we come out of that, that workroom and, and we're in front of cameras and stuff, we're one. And that's the way we need to be on this one. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see some of the Democrats uh, come over and, and, and vote with us. I don't think we're working that way, but, but I, think, I think there's enough reasonable thinking Democrats that we, we might be able to, to get a few to, to sway and come over and, and, and work with us on, on, especially trying to get a package mm -hmm. through because mm -hmm. again, nobody wants to shut down. I know everybody wants to show and they want, they want the picture and they want the drama and I get all that. That's a, that's not my personality, but uh, now it's not the time to do that. Well, we'll be watching. Uh, that's going to be an interesting September for sure. Um, let's talk about redistricting. You alluded to this earlier about Covington County uh, that is to your east now. 
Um, certainly, most likely going to be part of the first district one way or the other. There's still not finality to it. Might not be for, you know, at least a couple of three weeks. Um, but how do you go about that? Because you're obviously wanting to plan for not just the next election, but potentially the next term. And how do you go about that not knowing how far your district is going to extend, how much of Mobile might not be in it? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Well, one thing I learned in the private sector and being in business for myself, I don't worry about things that are out of my control. This one's out of our control. We, we, we had a brief chance to state the way we would like the districts drawn. Uh, we, we, the members, uh, the House uh, picked it up. They, I think they did a great job in the map they drew. I like that one. The Senate drew their map, obviously. Uh, I, I mean, I like both of those maps. I think they both make sense. Uh, to me, so now it's in the hands of the of the court, uh, you know, the the three panel uh, court there. So we'll see. Uh, we could hear something as early as today, or maybe even tomorrow. Uh, I understood originally that they were supposed to have a decision back to us by the twenty first, which I think is Friday. I, I might have my days mixed up there, but but uh, if that's the case, we'll we'll get our lines redrawn. I hope it stays the way it is. I know uh, Congressman Moore is is hoping the same thing because the last thing we want, the last thing we need is a member on member running against one another. Uh, that that's uh, that's a no situation, a good situation for anybody. So hopefully they'll honor that. I know that's supposed to be one of the factors when when they're going through these redistricting. Hopefully the courts will honor that and, and keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of your colleagues, you and all five of your Republican colleagues uh, a couple of weeks ago all together uh, endorsed former President Donald Trump in his bid for president this time around. It was, it was big news, right? It was the night that he was in town uh, for that big speech. Um, so there, there obviously was some like coordination there. So I'm, I was hoping you could kind of take me behind the scenes. What, how did that come about sort of as a delegation? Well, as a delegation, uh, you know, I, I think I was the last member, not necessarily to buy into it, but I was the last member I think they actually approached and talked to. Uh, and, 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 I, and I talked to Trump and, and I had conversations with him uh, via phone and uh, the very positive conversations is some of the stuff that I would like to see, um, you know, him not only doing the campaign, but, you know, after he wins. Uh, I, I, I felt much better when I got off the phone. Uh, they made sure we were there when he landed. Uh, we, we rode in his, his uh, uh, caravan of uh, Suburbans. We all rode together to the event. We spent time with him behind the scenes. Uh, and, and we did it for a reason. I mean, as a Republican Party, you know, we were all hoping to have a good, solid race. Everybody loves a good race. Uh, even if you got the winning horse, you know you got the winning horse. You still want a good race. Uh, no one has broke out so far. And that was part of the conversation the five of us or six of us actually had. Uh, no, no one had, has broke out and no one has really uh, shined. So we did what we did with, with Trump to show unity in the state of Alabama. We're we're proud of uh, of, of Trump. We're proud of what he's what he did when he was in office, uh, and we expect him to do the same, if not better, when he gets in office. Uh, after this next election, you know, Trump has got that magic. You know, he's like Elvis Presley. Uh, you know, Elvis could walk into a room and, and, and it was just like electricity. And uh, at, Donald Trump has that charismatic side about him. Uh, I was shocked when I got to Montgomery. I was not expecting what, what we saw when we got there. And when I say that, I'm talking about the room full of people and the excitement that was in that room. And uh, there were people standing outside trying to get a look at Trump. Uh, it was it was like a rock concert. It truly was. And he did a great job. He, he spoke well, some things that I think we need to hear. You mentioned, you know, the legal trouble. There's all there's all the legal troubles. The most recent being Georgia, as you mentioned, um, that also involves several of his advisors. Should that or any of the other ones result in conviction? Would that change your uh, outlook? Would that change your endorsement or your support? For Trump? There's little doubt in my mind that he's going to be convicted in New York and Georgia. I think they will convict him. It's, it's when it gets to the Supreme Court, it's going to be kicked out. I, I think his rights as, as an individual in this country supersedes him being president. Uh, and, and 
statements like something as simple as you've got to find me some more votes. I don't know of an elected official in the world that has been behind that hadn't said that. I mean, that that's pretty common conversation. You know, you got to find me some more votes. And it's almost a desperate plea uh, that, that we've all said before, because I've obviously been in a couple of campaigns where I've gotten behind. Uh, but I, I think holding it's him, little, I think all this is political. from the president, though, right? It's a little different coming from the president. Well, he's the still States a human a... being. He's still an individual. He still has got the rights to, as as you and I do, I, whether he's president or not. He still has that right. But I think so much of this is is riding on the First Amendment. And I, I think as a country, if we don't push back on this, I think what we're going to see is they'll start chipping away at everybody's rights. That's the part that really disturbs me the most. Uh, they're, they're using Trump uh, as, as a whipping tool right now. And God bless him. I don't know how he's doing what he's doing. And he and I had this conversation. But uh, if they can do it to Trump, they can do it to anybody. And, and what are they doing? It's the First Amendment rights issue to me. When, when, you, when you look at, at because what he says is what they're trying to hold him on or, or, or trying, trying to prosecute him on. Well, Congressman, we're out of time, but thank you so much for coming on the show. We look forward to talking again, and we'll be following what happens in Washington. Fantastic. Thank you. God bless. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Joining me next is Zondra Jones, Vice President of Philanthropy and Learning for the Women's Foundation of Alabama. Zondra, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Thanks so much, Todd, for having me. Well, I want to get into some of the work you've been doing lately, but first I wanted, uh, I was hoping you could kind of refresh our audience's memory about the Women's Foundation and its role here in the state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you know, Todd, Women's Foundation has been around for several decades now, almost 30 years. Um, for 27 years now, we have been the state's only public women's foundation. As you may recall, we started focused on the five counties in the greater Birmingham area, mm -hmm. but really leaned into understanding the needs of women across the state and becoming an organization that could serve and provide funding for women's economic opportunity across the state. And so now we're Women's Foundation of Alabama um, and we really are just fighting to dismantle economic barriers to women fully participating in the economy. Hmm. Well, I know that you're wrapping up this grant cycle, yeah. right? And, yes. and y'all have been messaging on this. Can you kind of walk me through what that, what does that mean? What is a grant cycle and what are the, what's the type of work that y'all have been doing? Sure, I think that's a great question, especially for this audience that I know is really familiar with our policy work. Um, so Women's Foundation of Alabama, we work through policy, philanthropy, and research mm -hmm. to expand opportunity for women. And so when we think about grant making, what we're really talking about is what's happening on the ground in communities. So our policy work is often taking place and in the legislature in Montgomery, and we're thinking about what's happening statewide and what's happening in the long term. But our women have short-term needs. They have immediate needs that have to be met. And when we think about the economy, we're really thinking about opportunities for education, for access to employment. And so our grants are really our opportunity to learn from organizations across the state, the nonprofit organizations that are doing amazing work on behalf of women, and find out just what's working. So this is where we open the doors. We'll have over 100 applicants, nonprofit organizations across the state that are telling us these are the ways that we are influencing and impacting women's economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. So how would you say that grant making, I mean, you kind of got at it, but that grant making folds into the Women's Foundation's overall mission. Yeah. Um, so 
at the heart of what we do as a foundation is grant making. And that is really partnering and collaborating with nonprofit organizations and helping to strengthen and build capacity for the work that they're doing. We have the great privilege and opportunity of being able to kind of stand in the middle and bring together the best models, evidence-backed practices and organizations that are doing work that's really making an impact in the community and then we get to scale it. So for example, we started working with Jefferson State Community College in mm -hmm. Birmingham and the program has now grown to include over 12 community colleges that we work with where we bring all these different partners together to ensure that not only are women getting access to this training and credentials in high demand, high growth careers, but they have the supports to ensure they can complete those classes mm -hmm. and actually do that work. So that means paying for childcare, that means ensuring that women have access to funds for transportation costs. Any sort of barriers that might have arisen, we are working with the community colleges to ensure that those barriers are canceled out. Mm -hmm. And so our grant making gives us the opportunity to do that at scale across the state. I see. Oh, that's so important. We've talked a lot on this program about barriers to, to the oh, workforce yeah. and, and the workforce participation and all that and, and how all that's playing together. So. Um, I love it when when things are are coming together and, and um, you know folks identifying those problems and and attacking them. So I was reading about the the four pillars. I'm sorry, the three pillars yeah. uh, of what you're doing. It's women in work, women in leadership, women in well-being. Talk about these three pillars and what they mean. Yeah. I, first of all, I love it, Todd. You got that 100% correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> those are. That doesn't me, always so. happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited when I hear other people repeat back the work that we've been doing because it's really exciting. So one of the things that Women's Foundation has been really good at is identifying models across the country and then being able to bring those back, identify partner organizations to participate in those models. So for instance, our two-gen approach where we focus on not just the mom, but the mom and the child to ensure that the family unit is being considered when we talk about economic opportunity. Mm. So with these three pillars, Women in work, we're thinking about how do we enable women to access work opportunities? I think we all know what that means. But with women in leadership and women in well being, we're really leaning into this idea that women are more than workers, they're more than cogs in a machine. And so with women in leadership, we want to be really deliberate in ensuring that women are being invested in and that their leadership is also being invested in. So studies show that when women lead, change and communities follow. And the impact is often much more broad and considered for the entire community. Mm. And so we are often thinking about how can we ensure that women are given the space, the training and the opportunities to lead. And then when we think about women and well-being, we're really saying that it takes more than wages to live a fulfilled life. There are actually eight dimensions of well-being. Our grant making focuses on three of those and that's physical health, mental health, and then financial well-being. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to take these three pieces of this puzzle to say, these are the things that we think can help women thrive in our economy and ultimately that helps the state of Alabama's economy only grow stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, holistic approach, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, speaking of the, the state and the economy, I was gonna ask you what the latest research shows mm -hmm. about economic opportunities for women, but also maybe some challenges that still exist for women specifically in the economy. Yeah, you know, I, I think about um, this state and the growth that we've had over the last several years. I think our um, state has done a really great job of attracting industry, and yet what we know is that even within this growth, there are still 80,000 women is the number that we have missing from the workforce. And so that speaks to workforce participation. And there are a number of reasons that our workforce participation numbers are lower, but barriers such as access to childcare or access to healthcare, paid family leave, um, or being able to make a family sustain wage, those barriers still exist and they still keep people out of the workforce, particularly women 
for whom the burden of caregiving is often the strongest. Um, and so when I think about that, Todd, and I add to it the fact that 75% of women in Alabama are the breadwinner, either primary or partial breadwinner for their family, um, those are the things that keep me up at night. Mm. And those are the challenges that we're really trying to work with, not only our grantee partners and nonprofit organizations, but policymakers, legislators, um, and our corporate partners to solve. Mm -hmm. It does seem like these issues are being highlighted more than ever, maybe post pandemic. Mm -hmm. I know folks like yourself have been talking about it for a long time, yeah. but maybe uh, the pandemic sort of brought it into relief. And it's, it's good that we're at least more aware. Uh, the, the, I mean, state lawmakers, um, you know, policymakers are more aware of these things. And so That's thank right. you for coming on the show and talking about some of these things on behalf of the Women's Foundation. Thank you, that's right. We have to define the problem before we can begin to think about solving it. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be here sharing with you for you giving us this platform to have this conversation. Look forward to having you back. Absolutely. Zondra Jones of the Women's Foundation of Alabama. Thank you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Joining me next is Dr. Scott Harris, Public Health Officer for the state of Alabama. Doc, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Todd. Good to see you. This used to be a very regular visit, <laughs> and I think it's it's good news that it's not, right? We're not Absolutely. in a pandemic where we're heavily relying on every word um, of advice, but it's great to have you back on the show. Yeah, it's always good to be here. Thank you. One reason I wanted to have you on is to talk about this heat. I know y'all put some advisories out. Um, I mean, it's got to be pretty hot for the public health department to, to be saying, look, take take precautions. Uh, what worries you the most about heat and what do you want people to know to protect themselves? Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad for the chance to talk about this. You know, we I'm from Alabama like you are and we're used to hot summers and we think, you know, it's always hot every summer and it is. But what we're experiencing now is really something else. You know, it may be not unprecedented, but we have had a streak of days here in the, the, our area of the state for uh, several in a row, more than 100 degrees, even when it cools off, supposedly at the first of next week, it's going to be high 90s. Uh, and we're not used to that, you know, even with living in Alabama. So we want to remind people that, uh, first of all, check on those people who can't take care of themselves very well. So if you have older people or people with chronic health problems, make sure they're keeping cool. You know, uh, try to be indoors if at all possible with an air conditioner if at all possible. Uh, remember just plain fans don't really cool you well when the air temperature is 100 degrees you know that's mm -hmm. how a convection oven works and so so don't rely on a fan for that but it's really important to stay hydrated for sure and you know try to avoid caffeine and alcohol but just drink water or drink drinks that will rehydrate you um, it's hard to, to stay cool with this heat and also this humidity, you know, uh, sweating is, is our natural way of cooling our bodies, but if the sweat can not evaporate easily, which it cannot do when there's high humidity, mm -hmm. it doesn't really cool you. You know, sweating is just dehydrating you further. It's not actually helping you cool or at least not very efficiently. So, so remember to check on those people who need help. That also applies to young kids, you know, particularly under age two, they can uh, get overheated quickly. They may not be able to express, you know, that they're thirsty uh, as easily and you know need you to, to check on them more often and then one thing sometimes people don't think about is your pets you know think about your pets many people have pets that live outdoors uh, it is not really a good time to do that if you have an option you know so m many people just don't have a choice of course they work outdoors we have kids starting high school football um, we have people that have other outdoor activities but we really want them to limit their time, if at all possible, and certainly try to limit time in the middle of the day when it's as hot as it is. Mm -hmm. You mentioned how it's this is rare, right? This is not something we deal with every single year. So people might be, they might go through a heat 
episode, a heat related illness or something, and not know it? What are the warning signs to kind of look out for? Because there's different levels of this, right? Leading up to heat stroke. Sure, absolutely. You know, people can get simply overheated, and most of us know what that feeling's like, but it can progress in, into what we think of as heat exhaustion. You know, people feel really profoundly, profoundly fatigued. Uh, you may uh, get to the point where you're, you just have weakness and are not able to get up. You, you typically have a lot of thirst at that point. Um, you can get, you know, dizzy if you move around uh, very quickly. And if that's not treated, you can really progress to heat stroke. And so at that point, people typically aren't sweating anymore. Uh, sort of paradoxically, sometimes they don't even uh, feel thirsty, uh, but they can lose consciousness. You know, they tend to, they can become confused or, or, or even unconscious, as I said. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, there are seven or 800 Americans every year who die from heat-related illnesses. And, you know, almost all those are preventable. Uh, which is the real tragedy, uh, but it's still something that happens even today in this in this time of you know air conditioning in, in most places. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, hopefully, the heat subsides eventually. But I uh, really appreciate you know the advice and, and what to look out for. It's also you know time for school, right? School's back in. Um, it seems like every parent I know of school age kids have have had them come back with some kind of you know illness. Either, either they have. They're going through it right now or they're going to, right? It's just sort of what happens every year. Uh, but what is some advice you have for parents with that big, you know, back to school time, avoiding illness or maybe make, making it less severe? Yeah, yeah we, we normally do expect a lot of uh, viruses to circulate in the fall. Uh, one is that sometimes as the temperature cools, hopefully it will cool, um, you do see more circulation of those things. But it's also related to our behavior, having you know more people indoors, like in the, in the uh, situation of schools that you're mentioning. Uh, we know kids are going to get sick. That's uh, always the way it is. Uh, and so, you know, first of all, remember to check with your child's pediatrician and make sure you're updated on everything. Um, the, the pandemic had so many disruptions but one of them was was that many kids just got behind on their routine shots and and wow. you know some of that was was misinformation about vaccines that, that's one story but then also there were just simply a lot of disruptions you know people uh, maybe they were not in school in person so they didn't need to get their blue card updated their immunization certificate updated or maybe their uh, pediatrician was only seeing sick kids and not doing well visits for a little while there when things were, were uh, so different so there are a lot of reasons that kids got behind we're seeing that start to recover, thankfully. Uh, but please make sure, you know, that your child is completely updated. And, uh, and you know, the, the one single piece of advice that we really want parents to remember is it's hard to implement sometimes. But if you have a sick kid, please try to keep them at home. You know, please try to keep them away from school. You know, that that's tough when both parents are working and, you know, it's not always easy to get daycare. Um, but please don't send your kid to school if your child is sick. You know, the, the school nurse is going to be responsible for um, taking care of that situation and they're going to have to call the parent to come pick them up anyway. And Yeah, that's and, what I keep hearing. Is yeah. that, well, we got it, you know, they're, yeah. they're out sick again. Right, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think parents really do that on purpose, but sometimes there are just a lot of demands on a parent's time. And, you know, if, you, if they don't seem too sick, you know, you think, well, it's probably okay to send them. But certainly if they have fever, we really don't want them to be around other kids if at all possible because that just, you know, even if they're not too sick, it, it, some other kids certainly could get sick. Mm -hmm. uh, your office has been messaging on this fall illness that's going around, RSV. Can you explain what RSV is and, and sort of what people should be looking out for? Sure, absolutely. So so we're really entering, as I said a minute ago, this fall respiratory virus season. And, and so the flu is always part of that. You know, we've talked about the flu many times on this show. You know, we still have COVID out there and, and you know, there are new vaccines coming for that. But also we actually uh, finally have some tools to address a virus that's called RSV. Now, now, many parents who've had small kids have probably dealt with RSV. It's a respiratory virus that can particularly affect kids in their first year of life or so and mm. it causes a uh, cough and shortness of breath and wheezing and if they have asthma it's particularly uh, a problem kids sometimes get hospitalized with that and have to be treated with, with really powerful medications uh, but we also see it sometimes at the other end of the spectrum we see older people maybe who have chronic health problems particularly lung problems who can get infected with RSV as well so in a sense you can think of it like we think of the flu it's not the same virus it's not the same disease but it, it's transmitted similarly and causes similar issues uh, and so at, at this time or by the end of this year we're actually going to have two 
uh, two new strategies available to us to treat this. There, there's going to be a new vaccine for seniors uh, age 65 and up that will help prevent uh, RSV. That's something that seniors should talk to their doctor about to see if that's appropriate. Uh, and there's also going to be a, what we call a monoclonal antibody product uh, that's used for RSV. Uh, you know, a lot of us remember these monoclonal products from COVID. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, the same sort of uh, technique, uh, exactly. but a different type of medication. My recollection is it saved folks' lives when yeah. it was finally developed. I, absolutely. And, and so the monoclonal for RSV is going to be something that's going to be offered to kids in that first year of life when they're most vulnerable to RSV. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you mentioned COVID, and I keep hearing from friends, my, my brother the other day, that, that it you know, I had COVID and it's like this, almost like this going around again. Is that the case or, I mean, is, is there another strain? Is it something we worried about or, or is this something we're just going to be going through every year? I, I think it's always going to be with us. You know, at, at this point, it's estimated that about 97% of Americans uh, have antibodies against COVID and, and that's either from infection or from, from vaccination or fr from both. Uh, there are new strains that continue to circulate. You know, fortunately, uh, these strains have not been as severe to most people as some of the things we saw early on in the pandemic. So it is still very common. But but again, for people who are chronically ill, for people uh, perhaps in nursing homes, for example, or just for people who are seniors, it still can be a really big deal. And we've seen an increase in hospitalizations in our state from the end of June and, until now um, that, that's more than doubled. You know, we have um, over 200 people in the state right now who are hospitalized with, with COVID around the state. That That's something our hospitals can handle that, you know, it's not anything to be alarmed about about but I think it may always kind of be that way I think we're probably always going to have this with us mm. well it's better than it's it's great it's good that we have vaccines treatments and we know how to deal with it rather than that, that first scary time uh, those the first months of COVID you mentioned vaccines and I wanted to get back around to this because the the vaccine maybe vaccines plural during COVID became so politicized right it just became such a political football to the point where you know people sort of identified their politics over whether or not they were vaccinated almost to this day it's still kind of going on and it, i remember reading that the doubt and and argument over these vaccines led people you mentioned you know kids kind of got behind and maybe some parents stopped doing it altogether has that happened and is there a concern just about in the future some illness comes around and we have a miracle vaccine people not taking it uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly is a concern. You know, there, there was a real loss of trust, you know, between uh, the public and the people that they normally come to for advice about vaccines. And, um, you know, we still hear some of that rhetoric going on now. Uh, you know, the original COVID vaccines were fully FDA approved within about six or seven months of when they were released, you know, back in the summer of 2021, which is the same process we follow with every vaccine we've ever taken ever. Uh, and yet people just fail to trust it, uh, you know, and, and that's still uh, an issue. Even now we're, you know, approaching our third generation of these vaccines. Uh, there's more safety data available on the COVID vaccine than any vaccine that's ever been developed ever. Uh, and uh, it's an appropriate vaccine, you know, in the right person to be taken, and yet people still mistrust it. And, and so that, that is unfortunate. Um, we've seen parents, as you mentioned, who, who just dis maybe vaccinated their older uh, children without uh, uh, any concerns after talking to their pediatrician, who now have a lot of questions and were, you know, wonder about whether they should vaccinate their young kids w with anything. You, you mean know? like the, the normal stuff, the measles stuff, you know? Me that. Measles or tetanus or, or uh, German measles or chicken pox, all of those vaccines. So that, that's starting to recover, you know, Fortunately, but you know, again, the the best advice that we have for people is please talk to your child's health care provider. You know, mm -hmm. talk talk to the person that sees them, who takes care of you and your family. They're the ones best positioned to give you that information. Um, in in most cases, I, I don't know of any reason that you wouldn't continue to vaccinate your kids the way we've been doing for 50 years. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, that's a question for you and your doctor. Are there lessons though for the public health, you know, apparatus in the way that it was messaged or, you know, different sort of conflicting 
information sometimes. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but are there lessons learned from from how it was rolled out? Uh, sure, I, I think a lot of lessons. You know, it, it was really clear that the that the messenger, in a lot of ways, was more important than the message. You know, it, it, it was such a divided time mm. during the pandemic, and and people were really not sure who to trust, and there was a lot of conflicting information. And because we were living in you know real time, you know, watching science evolve with this disease, the guidance changed, and so people you know hear that and they mistrust and they you know wonder well were you lying to me last week because this week you're telling me something different and so those are you know things that you can expect um, it made it really hard for people to know where to get good information and and also we kind of have this um, sort of uh, democratization of, of press if you will so that everybody can pull their news from exactly the person they want to get it from choose your news <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you do and, and you can you can be inside your own uh, bubble if you will and yeah. just reinforce you know what you already think and we had a hard time figuring out how to get through that I would say we didn't do it that well uh, in a lot of ways um, mm -hmm. I, I think what we have learned is that it really is important to work on building trust first uh, and then if and when you have an episode like this, people are more inclined to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's good that we're talking about it in hindsight. Um, Absolutely. Uh, those, those were rough years. Doc, we're out of time, but thanks so much for coming on the show. Look forward to having you back on. Thanks for having me, Todd. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. The quilters of G's Bend are world-renowned for their traditional quilt designs. The inhabitants of the small Alabama River town are mostly descendants of enslaved African Americans. G's Bend has demonstrated a persistent cultural wealth in the vibrant style of its quilts. Quilt making has a long history in Alabama, and there are no finer examples of this art form than the motifs and craftsmanship of the quilts of G's Bend. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week at the same time right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.